and, and, and facilitating community uh, through something as simple as a cup of coffee. It was such an original idea to, to actually incorporate sort of soft furnishings, the things that we take for granted today, but, but sofas, bookcases, allowing consumers to feel like they're in their own homes. That was Howard Short's moment of genius. The model of the cafe as the third place has been adopted by all the successful brands. If you look carefully, you will see that all coffee shops are planned out with precision. In this store, there's about four different zones. But at the front of the store, you'll see there's some seating right by the windows. The customers can enjoy the view outside, but also as important, other customers can see there are people in there. This is a great place to be. There are other customers I'm going to go in and join. Behind me, over my shoulder, there's perch seating. This is very reminiscent of the traditional espresso houses in Italy, where you have your espresso, you stand, you perch, you drink it and you go. We have big community tables where customers can come and sit, either as groups or individually, working on their laptops, reading, whatever. And then we have softer seating, it's a little bit more intimate. Back in 1990s America, the third place became part of the zeitgeist. American sitcoms like Friends cast the coffee shop in a central role as a stylish home from home. 5, 96, 97. See, I told you, less than 100 steps from our place to here. You got way too much free time, man. <laughs> when Friends first aired in the UK, lounging on sofas in a cafe with your nearest and dearest seemed like an exotic new concept. Happy birthday, pal. We love you, man. In Britain, we already had a centuries-old venue for meeting friends and socialising, a place that formed the essential backdrop of British sitcoms like Only Fools and Horses. The local boozer. All right, Rodney, how'd you get on at Hampton Court? I want to talk. Well, what happened? Cassandra gave him the elbow in the maze. Oh, that sounds painful. <laughs> While Del Boy and Uncle Albert were sympathising with Rodney down the nag's head, all was not well in the pub world. Britain's established brewers had become so successful that the government decided it was time to loosen their monopolistic grip. Britain's pubs could be in for big changes after a report today by the Monopolies Commission criticising the breweries. The Commission says beer is too expensive and the breweries own too many pubs. One brewer, Whitbread, was forced to dispose of almost a third of its 6,000 pubs. The top brass decided Whitbread had to diversify and it identified female spending power as a huge emerging market. Women have literally come out of the home. Now, what that's meant, of course, is that they've had their own income, their own wherewithal, their own tastes. And they weren't just going to be satisfied with having a, you know, a baby sham down the pub now and again with their husbands. Whitbread wanted to appeal to all these new female spenders, and it found the answer quite by accident. On a trip to Canada in 1993, I visited what was probably the first Starbucks outside of the United States uh, in downtown Vancouver. Uh, and was interested, but didn't think very much more of it. Uh, but seven or eight months later, going through the same intersection, I was absolutely amazed to see on the opposite corner of the intersection another Starbucks. And both Starbucks were trading well. It was a bit like a light bulb going on. Whitbread's coffee light bulb had not lit up quickly enough to satisfy two American expats who found themselves stranded in London in the 90s longing for a decent cup of coffee. The very first morning Allie was in London, she walked me to work. We walked across Hyde Park and we stopped at this little Italian cafe because she wanted to get a coffee. Scott and Ali Svensson had come to London from Seattle, where they had been Starbucks devotees. I was trying to explain to her that the coffee experience was going to be different from what she had just come from. The coffee offering in Britain in the 1990s was abysmal. I mean, there was absolutely no reason for anyone to drink it. 
It didn't taste very nice, it didn't smell very nice, it didn't look very nice. Why would anyone drink that gloopy mess? Desperate for a proper latte, the Svensons decided that it was up to them to change the face of British coffee. They set up their own coffee bar and they called it the Seattle Coffee Company. We opened in April, but it worked in about five minutes. We tinkered with that through that very hot summer, and at the end of that year, we opened two more in December. At precisely the same time, Whitbread found the ideal way to enter the coffee market. We thought briefly about perhaps approaching Starbucks for the UK franchise, but our main uh, thrust was to find if there was a, an acquisition uh, that we could make of a small company uh, and drive forward from there. And Costa ticked virtually all of our boxes. People were just starting to get the idea that it might be part of their, their daily routine and what they did. Um, so it was, um, you could argue, incredibly prescient um, or a little bit lucky as well. Um, but equally, it was uh, the start of the, you know, an enormous growth industry in the UK. In the 1990s coffee gold rush, Costa Coffee and the Seattle Coffee Company were joined by Coffee Republic, Cafe Nero, and a host of wannabe coffee brands. Without a shadow of a doubt, we were in it for the logo and the paper cups early days. We didn't really care or know about the coffee, but we thought it looked great. I, I certainly was part of that. I thought I looked so cool. The coffee competition was about to get a lot more fierce. By now, Howard Schultz had conquered America, and he wanted to go global. I want to be able to be one of those rare companies that is ubiquitous. Schultz had 1,600 stores in the U.S., and he had his eye on Britain. In 1998, he made the Svensons an offer it would have seemed rude to refuse. It came down to Howard Schultz and I sitting in a restaurant in London and, and having a philosophical conversation and ultimately reaching across the table and shaking hands. The Svensons walked away 50 million pounds richer, and Starbucks had arrived in Britain. It's mid-morning at Costa's Roastery, and a tasting is underway. Gennaro and his team regularly take batches they are planning to use and sample them according to age-old tasting rituals. The slapping is not just for fun. It sprays the coffee all over the tasters' taste buds so they can profile each individual batch of beans. Our job here is to maintain the consistency of our in-store mock Italian blend. We're using coffee from all over the world. We're using Colombian coffee, Costa Rican coffee, uh, Ecuadorian coffee. Some of these origins, their harvests obviously are at different times. So at different times throughout the year, the coffee will perform slightly differently. The danger is, if we do not constantly check the coffee, not just at the end of the season, but throughout the season, we cannot guarantee the consistency in our stores. So that's why it's so important that we do it all the time. Costa's flavour clearly plays well with us because it is Britain's number one coffee brand. It's especially popular with women aged 35 to 54. Last year, the company turned over £648 million in the UK. I really like Costa Coffee because it's nice and spacious so I can get the buggy in. I actually really like their coffee as well. It's quite mild and I like to have their decaf coffee. I like to sit down and read the paper while Layla's asleep and just have half an hour for myself. Starbucks is popular for its iced drinks and its American branding, and it's a favourite of young people. Its UK cash tills rang up £419 million last year. I love the staff in here, they're yeah. always so friendly and so lovely. Yeah, the food's really good here as well, they always make like a really good drink for you as well. So. Nero has a strong Italian image, and it attracts a slightly more male audience. In 2013, Nero had UK takings of £215 million. Pounds. I've just had a, a routine for years where I've always wanted to have a coffee, reading my paper, you know, first thing in the morning before I literally hit the road, and 
For me personally, I like Nero's coffee. Having a favourite brand of coffee shop would once have been unimaginable. But as the coffee shop phenomenon flourished in the 90s, so did our appreciation of good, strong coffee. Tasting a stronger flavour is all about, for me, moving up the ladder of taste. And once you're up that rung on the ladder, it's almost impossible to go back. I started drinking what I believe at the time was called a wide bother, which was a skinny, decaffeinated cappuccino, no chocolate. Um, so I started ordering that just to be part, to be part of the gang, to have the cup, largely. Um, and at some point, I must have gone, what the hell, I'll have it caffeinated. And that was how, that was how my sort of addiction, fascination, obsession, love affair began. It's almost like that legal drug that's hooked everybody. Once exposed, that's it for life. <laughs> And it's not just the coffee that we have become hooked on. The whole theatre of coffee making draws us in from the moment we walk in the door. Hello. The way that we run our service is every barista engages with the customer and is an expert coffee maker. Therefore, the coffee machine has to be within their reach. They can't step more than one step over in order to, to make the coffee. We don't want to have the coffee uh, machine at the front to be a barrier to you as the customer. We don't want to create an emotional block. We want to create an emotional freedom and engagement and ease. They want to stand and make the coffee and, and talk to you at the same time, and then they turn back. If they happen to ever turn their back, then, it, then we do make sure that, the, that people see that we have the best espresso this side of Milan. This kind of rapport with chirpy baristas is a far cry from the British service culture of yesteryear. Service is now a competitive advantage. And if you think about how the, you know, the ante is absolutely being upped and the service standards have improved in the UK, coffee shops have definitely been an important part of that. By the time the new millennium dawned, we had been seduced. We discovered that we could sit for hours nursing a single cup of coffee. Coffee shops created more places for people to stop and to take time to snack, You'd use their uh, ever-growing laptops and computers at the time. We even learned a whole new language, just so we could put in our order. One shot, flat white, chai tea latte, soya latte, espresso, mocha, americano, cappuccino, chai latte, a one-shot decaf cappuccino. Starbucks had brought to the UK a cornucopia of drinks that were already selling well in the US, but were unheard of over here. Our number one drink is our skinny latte, and that remains pretty constant right through the year. At Christmas time, we have those really indulgent Christmas offerings that our customers love. But in the summertime, hopefully we'll get another great summer as we did last year, ice drinks become a very important part. And our frappuccinos now become really quite famous and something that our customers come in time and time for. We lapped up Starbucks concoctions, so not surprisingly, Starbucks style drinks have also appeared on its competitors' menus. If we see that something that's working, then, you know, our customers will be asking for it too. So clearly we would rather them come to us for that drink than anywhere else, so we give customers what they want, yeah, absolutely. If somebody from 25 years ago walked into a modern cafe, they'd be completely bewildered by the range of drinks on offer, all the different foreign names, all the different sizes, all the different combinations, the skinny, the full fat, the soya, the syrups. And once you've managed the difficult job of deciding which drink you want, there's one more hurdle to negotiate. What size do you like? If the drinks are confusing, then the cup sizes are a nightmare. So, on the off chance that you don't know your grandes from your primos, I present the Idiot's Guide to Coffee Sizing. At Café Nero, there are three no-nonsense sizes, the small, regular and grande. At Costa, you've got the primo, the medio and the massimo. And at Starbucks, there's the tall, grande and venti. And here's one more that you may not have heard of, the Starbucks short. One of the interesting deals available at Starbucks is the secret cappuccino, the, the, the coffee 